You know, in numerology, your birthday, you add up to be a number seven. And a number seven likes to keep the mystery going. <laughs> <laughs> Secret place for you and me Let our minds be caught up in a dream I mean, you, you did a, took off uh, on some of your stories too when you were in out the school. Teens. Yes. Out of the school and down the, the fire escape. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that I was, was a never, pretty I good was story. Never <laughs> Especially in the springtime when the birds were singing and the the fragrance of fresh flowers were coming in the window down my desk, and I remember, I'd, I remember my Spanish teacher would turn her back to me and to write something on the board, I'd slip out of the window and slide down that slide. And <laughs> I owned the world. I mean, yeah. the whole, my whole composure was different. Yeah. But I told a story in one of my books someplace that later on, when I had my gallery in Santa Fe, one of the things that what was most exhilarating to me was to go out to the airport, push the hangar door open, nobody ran, start my airplane up, taxi out, get permission to take off, and then when my wheels come up, I turn my radio off, and I don't have to think about where I'm going to land or anything for 600 miles. And I didn't, that was I didn't have a yeah. flight plan, I didn't know where I was going to land, I didn't much care, but I had a map, and I'd look at a little town down there, and it, if the town had a a rental car where well, I'd stop and I mean there were times when they didn't have a rental car and I would stop and I'd hire some old beat up car from a mechanic there to the airport overnight and mm -hmm. I'd go to the pawn shops and the rock shops and I remember I did that in Lander, Wyoming one time and the little Popo Aggie River ran through Lander and I was I was trying to get a, a rental car in the airport and this teenage this fourteen or fifteen year old boy was renting cars. And I rented a car from him, and I, he asked me what I was doing. I told him I was an arrowhead collector, and he said, well, I am too. And I said, well, let's go out and look for arrowheads. And, and he closed up, and the two of us went out on, on the river there, and, and I think both of us found an arrowhead. Do you think that they still, well, I, don't, I guess that you can't collect there now, huh? It depends on where you're looking. Uh, <laughs> you can't. You, you can't public land or Indian land you can on private okay. property you gotta have permission and yeah. a lot of the rules have changed then but I remember in the, in the early 70s I used to go up, up to Cody and meet my friend George Dabish who was a pretty good painter I wrote stories about him he and I would go up in the skylight country uh, east of Cody and look for buffalo skulls and I found that buffalo skull right over there. Oh, I is found. that it? That's the one in your book. And it has an arrowhead broken off. This arrowhead made out of basalt entered the, just under his left eye and broke off, and the bone grew completely back around that skull. Oh, I found okay. that with George Davis one day. But it was hard to find skulls, but it was easy to find caps off of, off the horns. You know, after after right, a year right. or so, that you can pull a cap oh, off wow. of a horn. There was quite a few times we could pick up 12 or 15 caps. Oh, okay, and you have his hat, right? What? George Davich's hat? Hat. The brown hat? Oh, the one. Well, I was up in, in his house in Cody one time and we were talking and he was an airhead collector and we were look, looking at his airheads and, and he, he had an old cowboy hat, a brown hat over there on the desk and I picked that up and put it on and it fit me just perfect. He said, first, I want you to have that. And he said, but I want you to know that I, I used to be a professional hunting guide. And he said, I, wore, I had 18 hunters kill grizzly bears with me while I was wearing this hat. And he wow. said, I want you to have it. And he put it back on my head. Wow. But I found that buffalo skull over there with George. And I found it, it still has pine needles down in, down in the nose cavities, but all that discoloration on, on his face was lichen. It was, it, was a, it was a green, growing lichen when I found that skull. It was under a big pine tree. Wow. It's a young bull, I think a year old or something. 
But you can't do anything anymore. It's all it's gone. All, there's too many rules. Yeah. There's too many rules in today's age. Everybody has a rule. You know, every generation thinks theirs is going to be the last. And one of these days it'll be true. Yeah. But it's important to, I think, to to do what you're doing, record these these stories. Otherwise, they're, they'll never be told, you know. Right. I went, I, I was on the board of the Buffalo Bill Center in, in, in Cody for 17 years. And we had a, Dick Cheney was on the board, the sitting vice president was on that board. And he had a party for us in, in Washington, D.C. at his house, which is the old vice president's residence, but it was the old Naval Observatory. And we had a party there, and Alan K. Simpson, retired senator from Wyoming, was chairman of the board. And there was a man by the name of, uh, I forget his name now, but, but he was a librarian of Congress. And I was talking to him, and he said, Mr. Finn, what are you interested in? I said, I'm interested in Lewis and Clark and Thomas Jefferson. He said, come to my office at 10 o'clock tomorrow. He handed me the first draft of the Declaration of Independence, written in ink by Thomas Jefferson, with ideas in the margin, notes in the margin by, I think, James Adams, and James Bass, and John Adams. This document was in a document protector, but here I'm holding that thing. Then he handed me the oversized document that Meriwether Lewis itemized what he wanted. He was wanted five thousand dollars from Congress to go up the river, the Lewis and Clark expedition, mm -hmm. and he itemized what he was going to spend the five thousand dollars. I'm holding that thing. Wow. He said they had they had fifteen thousand Thomas Jefferson letters and ten thousand items. Just think what the Library of Congress has in yes. George Washington, and George Custer, and Alexander Hamilton. And, on and on. It's probably the most valuable building in the world. Wow. Two, two of my ancestors signed the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. Two of them. Wow. It's, that's why it's interesting, like you said, to, to document track of that. Now I get to know that. Right. And it's fascinating. Right. It's mm -hmm. like I, I write things down all the time because 100 years from now somebody might want to know. of your own little environment. You don't, you don't, you may have one or two really good friends, but no more than that. You have a lot of really good acquaintances like the paper boy. Mm -hmm. but, but we live in a, we're very restricted in, in what our mind can conjure back because we don't have any experience there. When I first got in the, in the, in the art business, I didn't know what I'd been over, over half my life. I'd been spent a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. I had to learn. I had to learn the hard way some things. This, this trader came to me with a little human skull. It was about this big, mm -hmm. the size of an orange. And he said, "This is Napoleon's skull." He said, "I want a thousand dollars for it." I said, "That can't be Napoleon's skull. It's too small." He said, "Oh, it's his skull when he was a kid." <laughs> you have to go through a learning guy offered me a knife that killed Caesar, and I was going to buy it except the blood on the blade to smell too much like ketchup. So I have to learn. Every business has a lingo of all of its own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, you pay a price sometimes. But I've gotten a few, but I'm really very lucky that I haven't. Because your demeanor, mm -hmm. your demeanor is very calm. I guess. I, I can see people being very nice with you. Maybe because I'm the grandma type. That <laughs> the business. You're the girl next door. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, world's leading authority on that many crazy people. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's true. That is true. You are. Um, you can keep them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I. I don't know how you've managed to deal with it all these years. Because, um, it hasn't been easy, though. It's not well, always easy. Person asked me the other day. So, boss. What do you do when those people jump all over you and, and it seems like there's, everybody's on your case? I said I'd go out and water my trees. That's a good plan. Do you still get uh, 
like over a hundred emails a day. Are you? Yeah. It's yeah. Good, good. If you found it tomorrow, what would you do? Um, one of the things that I thought about that I'd like to do is allow my allow the, the, the kids to be able to take the their kids out. And travel and see some of these places that we've seen. Right now, they're all, you know, working jobs and they don't get that much vacation time. And I just would love for my grandkids to be able to get out and see some of these places that we've seen. See, so, that's, why, that's why I wrote the book and did That's what you said. Yeah. But I tell people that if, if you find a treasure chest this afternoon, put it on your bed and don't do anything. And think for at least 30 days. Mm -hmm. There's so much to think about. Yeah, it's the best time and to keep your start, mouth shut. Don't start making mistakes right off the bat. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. We, 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 we've talked, we've about, talked that. about that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you have talked Which, about it too. Well, right? I thought about this. I mm -hmm. actually thought if I was like out there in the middle of nowhere and it, I was to meet that treasure, there's no way I'm taking it and going in peace. There's going to be a little celebration right there in that moment, and I know I probably shouldn't do that, but I would not be able to contain myself to be like, woohoo! <laughs> yeah. It would be a very big woohoo. I might, my bones might lay next to it. <laughs> I might just die right there. <laughs> well, I remember very vividly I told myself when I, when I was walking back to my car. kind of a freedom and there was nobody around there. I remember saying in a loud voice, out loud, Forrest Finn, did you really do that? And I started laughing. <laughs> I mean, it, it was yeah. exhilarating to me. Yeah. It was such an outrageous thing to do. Yeah. And I told myself, yeah. But, but in the back of my mind, I knew that tomorrow, if, if I was sorry, I could go back and get it. You know, I, made, I made myself a promise I will never go back. And I, and I have not been back in 10 years. You know, in numerology, your birthday, you add up to be a number seven. And a number seven likes to keep the mystery going. And <laughs> people like this. <laughs> I was like, wow, that is so true. But I don't know a lot of people that can keep a secret. Well, tell me not in mournful numbers. Life is but an empty dream. Or the soul is dead that slumbers and things are never what they say. <laughs> Everybody has a different take on it. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it so good. Mm -hmm. What people tell me in his email is that just, I post a lot on Mondell Nietzsche's blog. And mm -hmm. I've, had, I've had nine people send me an email and said I was, I was going to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And then I read about your treasure story. And give them hope. Yeah. Well, we were going into a pretty good recession when I had that treasure chest. Mm -hmm. I think it yeah. was one of my things. And my, you know, headlines were full of despair and people losing their jobs. And I wanted to give people some hope. Probably exceeded my ex expectations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in a million years, I couldn't do that over again. Yeah. And when I had, when I hit the treasure, I had a plan. I, and I thought about it for. I, I thought I, I tried to think of everything, but you can't think of everything. Mm -hmm. When I hit that treasure, mm -hmm. thing, several things had to work for me, and all of them worked perfectly. If any one of them had not worked, it, it could have been bad. Everything worked. There was, a, there was a bigger hand guiding me when I did that. Yeah. And I'm sure that, did, I mean, you you probably never realized how big that yeah. this would have become. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea now how many people that, in your guess, your best guess, that are searching? Well, I said no. before last summer that I spent a half a day thinking about it and you know, at that time I was getting over 100 emails a day, and when you multiply that by nine, that's 250,000 emails. Yeah. And when you put, and all 
of those people are searchers or uh, potential searchers. And I got that uh, email like that from, from a, somebody's wife. She's got a husband and two kids, and they've got kids. And, and I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that, and I, and I said, 350,000 people have looked for my treasure. That counts some of them that have looked 50 and 100 times. Mm -hmm. But some of the people on the block say it's impossible. It couldn't be 350,000 people. So, so I, don't, I have to admit that I don't know. Yeah. It'd be hard because not everybody comes out of the shadows either. Right. They There's just a guy stay. taking a survey now, and you, you can fill out a questionnaire. He's, he's oh, a psychiatrist from North, from North Dakota, and uh, he, he thinks 350,000, about 350,000 searches is low. Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's one of those intangible things. It that grows over here, that too. You don't ever yeah. know. But the city of Santa, the mayor of Santa Fe gave me a proclamation because the occupancy rate in the motels was up 6% three years in a row and nobody could figure out why. It's brought us here yeah. ha at least half a dozen times. Yeah. You know, we've stayed here at least half a dozen times. Yeah. It's interesting that so many different things can happen. I was in the bookstore signing books one afternoon and this couple walked up to me and I didn't know them, but they recognized me as they were, I was signing my books. And they told me a story about they went to there where they, in, in Yellowstone Park where they knew the treasure was. They absolutely knew the treasure was there. Mm -hmm. they, they went to their spot and two rangers were digging <laughs> in uniform. <laughs> they were looking for the treasure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you know, you don't know who the players are if you don't have a program. Yeah, that's funny. And then they all, and the rangers said they laughed about it. I've had people that have contacted me though and, and asked me if I would go, if they would tell me where their where search, was. where if they could tell me mm -hmm. their search, where it was, if I would go because they couldn't go. And, and I, it for if them. I would go get it for them, we would split it. Uh, I get it. that all the time. This yeah. lady sent me an email and says, Mr. Finn, my my pickup truck is about dead. He, she said, I, th I think I can make it from Wichita to Santa Fe, but my truck is going to be dead. Do you mind taking me in your car to the rest of the <laughs> way? <laughs> I, I could almost bet, and I don't make bets that I'm mm. but I would bet money that when and if that treasure is ever found, there will be a line of people saying it, it was partly theirs because that was their spot. <laughs> Yeah. They have been to that spot and it's theirs and it's not yours because mm -hmm. I found it first even though I don't have it. You know, they'll say that. So what does that yes. mean if you find the treasure? That, that keep your mouth shut and take it home. Put it on your bed and keep your mouth shut. It's, it's, it's not 30 days. days. It's 90 days. <laughs> 90 days. <laughs> so how long it takes a check to clear back in those days? Well, I'll tell you, that thing is so visual. I mean. I used to go in my vault where I kept it and I'd raise that lid and look at that stuff in there and I'd just, you know, I'd, I'd click to that stuff for 12 or 15 years trying mm -hmm. to fill that thing up. But, you know, it's so visual, I mean, I, I don't have the words to describe, I'm not eloquent enough to, mm -hmm. but I've said before, you know, if you find that treasure chest, you put it on your lap and you raise that lid, you either can one of two or three things, you're going to faint, you're going to break out laughing, or you're going to be disbel disbelieving, but your eyes are going to open. Mm -hmm. and you're, Jesus. I hope my heart can handle it, because I, like I said, my bones just might lay there. I just might. It would be too much. Wow. I visualized it. Trust me, I visualized that moment, as I'm sure many well, have, and it would probably want to come close. The treasure chest was pretty much full. I was satisfied with what was in the treasure chest. And, and I knew that I was going to hide it in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the thought came over me, you know, this, it's kind of an, it, as far as I'm concerned, the chest is empty because I want, I'm not a part of it. I want to be part of it. And then I remember a bracelet I had in my vault that it had 22 little turquoise beads in it that when Richard Weatherall first discovered Mesa Verde and climbed down the bluffs and walked into Mesa Verde, he picked up these 22 little turquoise beads. Mm -hmm. A couple of years later, when he was excavating 
a security Indian work for him, made a jeweler made him this little gold bracelet with the 22 beads in it. And it became Fred Harvey's. Richard Wallowell sold it to Fred Harvey, and Fred Harvey gave it to the Herb Museum and his estate, gave it to the Herb Museum in Phoenix, then it's being acquisitioned into the Herb Museum. And this man by the name of Byron Harvey was a relative of Fred Harvey's, and he had some authority down. I don't know exactly what was going on, but I wanted in a pool game with, with Byron Harvey. I love the history of that. It fit me perfect. I said, I said I'm going to put that thing in there. That's the last thing I put in there, and I lowered the lid, and I, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm in that treasure chest. Part, part of me is in that treasure chest, and I believe that. I'm comfortable with that thought. See, those stories that you have like that, and I'm just so glad that you can share them with us because they're priceless. You know, every generation thinks theirs is going to be the last. And one of these days it'll be true. Yeah. Hold my hand and hear the words I say. Close your eyes and let us fade away. Left, but you and